when people think sales and they stop being like, oh my gosh, it's so, yeah, so, so aggressive. And closing is essentially to me how you agree business with somebody and you move forward. Um, that could be in taking payment, that could be agreeing next steps, it could be starting a conversation. That, that is what we look at when we talk about closing. Um, a closing coach, so my speciality actually sits in a couple of areas with sales. Um, first of all, closing absolutely. So that is like, how do we go ahead and take payment on a call, but also focusing on cold outreach as well, or just generating more business for, for businesses that are trying to kind of generate that there as well. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of different kind of education platforms that we can support with people um, from coaching or pre-recorded training. So that is what we do. We help people increase what they do in their skill set and sales. Okay, so is it is it your company? It is, yes. It is. Oh, wow. Okay, wow, that's very impressive. Um, and how did you, when did you start it and how did you come about starting it? So for me, Ollie, it was totally by accident. Like, totally by accident. Um, so, oh my gosh, flashback to probably four or so years ago. Um, so I was in a marketing role for a very, very successful um, investment company. Um, and I was bringing, bringing loads and loads and loads of leads into this company and their sales team just were closing. I, shock, being in the marketing position was just getting hammered every single day and every single board meeting being like, you're spending all this money on marketing, like nothing's happening. And I'm like, um, so I spent a really long time um, deciding to go and do stuff myself uh my mother does call me miss justice league so i don't like it when things are bad <laughs> so i uh went out to uh basically yeah to go and listen to a ton of sales calls find out what was going wrong identified it through news of data and was like oh my gosh this is just totally being approached in the wrong way um i then used that strategy for that sales team and their close rate just went the change was like phenomenal um and then I decided that there was a, a huge opportunity in, in what I just cracked. So I then went into a career in sales and, and launching what, what we do here. Um, over the last eight years in total, really, we've then developed everything that we do in terms of my skill set, in terms of what we teach them, our clients that we work with. And uh, yeah, that's why I started the business. There's a lot of people that I found who feel like sales is really, really slimy really really gross and it makes everybody feel horrible and uncomfortable on both sides of the table and the reality of it is is it's because that that is very much because of how other people are selling so these age-old kind of sleazy sales carmen that we see and all of that type of sales strategy is what's associated with it so there's loads of business owners that have got great products great services they actually want to help people and yeah they're making money from it but they can genuinely support these people but I work with some clients that are really, really nervous to go through that sales approach. So they're not selling. Um, so that's typically the type of people that we helped predominantly, but that's now grown into bigger businesses, sales teams that are trying to do cold outreach and growing from there. So a very long answer to a short question. That's why I started the business and kind of where, where we are today with it. Brilliant. Yeah. You train, I was going to say nervous people. If you're a nervous person that I wouldn't really imagine that you would endeavor to pursue sales because you know just from speaking to you for five minutes you're clearly a very extroverted and I imagine a resilient person and that I think that's a lot of where this was one of the questions but we'll, we'll probably we can talk about it later but where one of the um, possible uh, demonizations of salesmanship and salespeople comes from is because highly extrovert the, th the interesting thing about because uh, i'm obviously very interested in psychology uh people say that extra people think that extroverted people are interested in people but that's actually not true Intr extroverted people aren't interested in people they're interested in the social landscape that we engage in when we talk conversationally so the people that are interested in people are the are agreeable people and they're uh they're the ones that are compassionate and polite whereas extroverted people so if you're very highly extroverted and you're very disagreeable uh you're you're prone to to narcissisms narcissism so a great example of someone who's highly extroverted and low and disagreeable on us would be uh jordan belfort from the wolf of wall street so when when i watch him yeah and when you listen to him 
you can completely work him out. He's ex- exceptionally extroverted, so he can woo people and he can charm people, but he just doesn't eat. Or he's, I reckon, because what tends to happen is people become more agreeable as they get older. And obviously, what he went through, I'm not saying that he's Satan himself. He will have rectified that and atoned for it. But when he was a young man, he would have, he was obviously a very disagreeable, which is quite common. Men tend to be more disagreeable than women. And then that's where the sleazy salesman uh, sort of stereotype comes from. It comes from because it it can attract those sorts of people. There's there's a brilliant show that I absolutely love called White Gold, I think, um, which is a channel for about... Yeah, 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 it's brilliant. And it's like a caricaturization of salespeople. And, And that's you know nailing the sort of stereotypes but that's i completely agree with you about sales should be connecting people that have that one person that can provide a service and the other person that is receptive to a service and creating an environment that is the most uh as you said earlier just uh justified and I hate using the term equal, but equal an equal uh, transaction. So, if you could, given your expertise of sales and what what you what you do, if you could uh, epitomize the sales as an sort of a concept, how would you? What would you say se- se- selling is beyond the obvious? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to answer that for you, but I'm also going to circle back to the introvert versus extrovert thing because okay. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. So I would class myself as an extrovert You're as joking. I'm in selling. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I am, and this is this is what I find really interesting. So I actually, and this is controversial, so I actually think extroverts make the worst salespeople. And the reason that I think that is because exactly to what you said, they typically tend to, they're surface level and they're they're focused on, okay, we want to get out of this and what is the goal and I'm going to present and I'm being me. And actually it can be really, really like detrimental to a sales conversation if if they're like that. So we actually teach a strategy called, um, our our main ethos and strategy is CDP is what we call it, is is what, what, what we're actually teaching. But there's a method in that which I call character play. And this is something that I learned really, really early on. And it can, when we kind of talk about this, a lot of people think, well, that's really disingenuous. And like, I now don't like you because of X, Y, Z, but actually it's really, really important. So character play is the way of when we start working with a business, we basically work out who does your client or your prospective client need you to be in order to like you, want to buy from you and feel heard correctly. And then we build this kind of like skeleton character. Then what we do really early into the conversation is we start to then kind of judge, all right, who's this person on the other end? Do they need me to be that extroverted salesperson? Do they need me to be someone who's more calm and collected and whatever? And we we work with that really early on. And it's so interesting to see actually introverts can pick up on that so much better because they're just naturally more in tune to, like you said, watching people, understanding even just facial expressions, they understand body language better because they're more focused on the other person than they are sort of everyone else. So it's such an interesting like misconception about like extroverts. And you are right. There are so many extroverts in sales, but that's why sales has got such a bad rep, right? Like <laughs> it's all the wrong, the wrong character fit in, in the right role. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, if you're like highly extroverted and highly agreeable, you're just, you're a brilliant person to be around because not only are you interested in people, the individual that you're speaking with, but you're also interested in the the dynamic that you and the the interplay that you're engaging in. So you you are you are those those probably also helps you great salespeople. So you asked me how we kind of like summarize what what sales is. So from what we teach, so I mentioned CDP and what it is that we do there. I like to sort of relate sales to when you go to the doctors. So when you go to the doctors or when you're going to purchase something, you're looking for a problem or solved. So you're looking for a solution to the challenge that you've got. Now, 
the old style of sales is I don't care what your, your problem is and if you've got a problem this is what we're selling and this is why you need that it's the same thing when we talk about Wolf of Wall Street it's that age-old scene where they're like sell me this pan and it's like well I don't need a pan so it's that whole thing of like we can't sell things to people who don't need them I also hate the analogy of we can sell ice to Eskimos it's like well we don't want to sell ice to Eskimos I want to sell fishing rods and sleds and like things that are useful that they might need so it's actually changing that up to to how should we be selling it for people that need these um these different solutions and in terms of what sales is it's a consultation to understand why and what's going wrong it's a diagnosis of understanding but actually what is the right solution for that person and it's a prescription for in all honesty and ill trust and truth this is what i think is the right solution for you and that's where we get ethical sales so for me, it's consultation, diagnosis, prescription, which is CDP. So that's what I see sales as. Oh, say that again. Consultation, diagnosis, and prescription, which is, is what we teach. So that's what I see sales as. Okay, yeah, yeah. CDP, you, you practicality. I'm just trying to think if you could add an extra layer on there. No, CDP's good. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep going. We'll keep adding to the to the acronym. Um, God knows, we love to do that nowadays. Um, so, you mentioned earlier you were speaking about like deception, and mm -hmm. there kind of has to be you and use the term ethical selling. I think that's a really good term because we the whole selling sales itself is such a, a vast landscape and it's like a I don't know it's it's an it's a an archetype of phenomenon therefore it means that it spans across so many aspects of who we are and you can and therefore there are uh, underground and and dangerous uh poss possibilities which is obviously what we've seen with deception and what are some red flags to look out for in sales? What that people should be aware of, and that and that you've come across uh, in in your in your experience. Let me clarify the question first. So, are you looking from a seller's perspective or a seller's perspective? Um, from a customer's perspective, what are some red flags to look out for when when someone's trying to sell you something? How do you know if someone's genuine? Okay, so it's it's very much in, in how they genuinely listen and care. So we have a module in one of the trainings, which is, oh, there's a story behind this. You've unlocked a story, Ollie. Here we go. So <laughs> many, many moons ago, um, when, I, when I first got into, into sales um, from a corporate perspective, because I went through a journey of I wanted to learn every type of sales, so I went on a mission. When I was in corporate sales, um, there was this, this guy who was just so freaking cool and like he was really unassuming and he was really quiet and he never really went out for like lunch with anyone and he'd just like turn up to these sales meetings and he'd just bash out these massive sales targets that he was bringing in and I was like how are you doing this so I begged him to go for a coffee with me I was like please I was like I will buy you lunch I was like I'll only take 20 minutes I was like let's go out for a coffee and I was like I just want to ask you some questions so like I can learn and he was like okay fine we had a standing coffee. This was this was what this type of guy was. <laughs> he said, uh, I, said I, I said to him, I was like, look, I said, I don't know how you're going into these conversations with these people and you come out after 30 minutes and you know everything under the sun about this, this person. And I was like, I'm going into these meetings. I think I'm doing a good job, but I'm not getting to that level. I was like, how, what do you do? And he looked me dead in the eye and he just said, Emily, that we don't, we don't walk past a statement. We stop and pick it up. And I was like, "Oh my god!" And that was that was all that was all I needed at that point to be like, "Oh my gosh!" It was so simple. And I thought, "Oh my goodness!" And out of all of my meetings, everything changed from there. And I think it's again, it's just sometimes you need the simplest solution to this question you think is so complicated. And that is what my answer to to a red flag would be. If you're in a conversation and you say to somebody. Let's say, for example, it's 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 money making. You're looking to increase the business that you're getting through. You talk to a marketing client, for example. So if you said, my business isn't making enough money, and that person goes, okay, great, next. 
red flag. But they don't understand what does that mean to you? Are you making 100k a month and actually you just want to increase it by 10%? Are you in debt by loads? Like that, that is a surface level question. So if you're speaking to people who don't dig under that surface to genuinely understand red flag. The other thing still on the questioning theme is if they jump to asking you questions that aren't sensitive to what you've just told them or aren't very directly relevant to what you've just told them, I'd be concerned of whether they're actually listening and if they care. Typically, salespeople who don't have this sort of kind of analogy and training behind it, what they do is they skip to product-specific questions and it will be things like the budget that you've got the timeline that you're looking for it's all of those immediately like are you qualified for me to sell to rather than let's qualify what you need first and I think if they skip to that and they don't actually ask you relevant questions real real red flags for me in in sales okay just I thought that that's that's really helpful and interesting and the bit that you said about I love that I'll probably put that as the title actually um maybe not we'll see (laughs) Don't um, walk past a statement, pick it up. And there's a there's a thing. Do you know what NLP is? Have you, I'm sure you've heard of NLP, neuro linguistic programming. Yeah. So there's a guy that I watch on YouTube uh, called David Snyder, and he's like a mm-hmm. master in NLP and all sorts of other fields. And he talks about he could talk for hours and hours, and does talk for hours and hours about how to lot of influence people using nlp etc and he says 60 percent of what i could teach you is can be distilled into one statement and that is and this is applicable in sales in in dating in any aspect of life the most important words that someone has are the words that have just come out of their mouth so if you always use an example so if you it's called the echo technique where you echo back the words that someone has literally just said to you because it basically so you can't do it too much, obviously, because then people will crack onto what you're doing. It basically the the point is is that the, the through echoing them, you are implying you're sending them the the message that you have completely understood what they've said. And fundamentally, we all want to feel understood. So he uses the example of you know Mrs. Uh, Briggs calls up and says, "Oh, I'd like my son Johnny to." do lessons at such and such and he goes okay so you'd like your son johnny to do and then they're like yeah that's what i want and and the point is is that just that echoing is so affirming to them do you have you ever come across that have you ever used sort of or seen that used similar tactics before what's your opinion on it yeah so it's it's interesting so like Again, we, we have a module on this, which is is great. So we, we have a module that, that's basically talking about mirroring, which is the whole strategy of body language, toning, all of that. But the other thing is is in the spoken language. And we, we alluded to this briefly before, but it's also the importance of that, that point. So let's say somebody came to you and said, my team's not, oh, sorry, my team's struggling, for example. So say my team's struggling. Now, Yes, it's important to relay that back, but actually to put another level of of kind of guidelines on it, it is so important that you do not miss repeat a word. Like in that, if you suddenly tried to play back what you think is the pain point and you said, my your team's not performing rather than my team's struggling, it loses that whole trust that you built up in the whole conversation because it, we know in the English language, it is so complicated. <laughs> if we get one word wrong or even a pause or the tone in the way that you say something it can have a whole different meaning and when you've built up so much trust with using a strategy like cdp by getting that element wrong you can be at risk of offending or at risk of losing trust in what you've actually learned or just totally misdiagnosing what their challenges are so in repeating back to an individual and what they say it is so incredibly important the other thing that is actually really beneficial and again, we, we teach this, is we we like to call, um, when a client's telling you all of the challenges and problems that they have, we call it the poor. And the reason that we say that, so I'm mega neurodiverse. I am dyslexic, ADHD, everything under the sun. So in terms of kind of how my brain works, and this happens to a lot of people when they're just invited to talk, information comes in left, right, and center, and it's not necessarily in the right order. Our job on that sales call is to play back what they've told us 
but in a more logical way than they did in the first place. And actually that is so powerful because not only have we listened and understood, we've actually been able to collate it and play it back in a way that makes even more sense to them than they told us. So it is, it's so incredibly powerful and it's something that I, I absolutely love, love doing. Well, that's what, um, to look to a large degree, that's what therapy is. And that's what conversation yeah. is. The, uh, the idea of therapy. So Freud, um, would get his clients to sit on a, you know, the stereotypical psychoanalysis, lay on a bed and just speak. And he would, the point was, is obviously slightly different because it's not as personal, um, etc etc but so for the barriers are different but the idea was he would allow his clients to what he would call circumambulate around the point that they were trying to get to and then he would uh distill and uh as you said collate back to them sort of what they said and also them speaking aloud because we have this conception, this idea that thinking is a good way of working through our thoughts, but actually thinking isn't a good way of working through our thoughts. Thinking is a really, really poor um, alternative to speaking, which is why free speech is so important, but that's another topic. Because if people can't say what they think, they can't reorganize and they can't adapt and uh, progress their ideas and stuff because thinking is such a, a poor uh way of formulating our thoughts ironically um so that's that's really interesting so you would get people to um parrot back in a uh more cogent manner so that the people could go what was that to just to add some sort of to add like a a book note in the journey or so you could say you could say this is where we are and this is where we need to get to to sort of you know goal orientating yeah i mean good good question so the way that we do it we actually do it twice um so the first time is to just safety rail everything have you understood everything do you need to clarify anything are you on the right track and that builds a little bit of trust because they really early on understand that you're listening then much later on once we've gone through a few different processes Actually, what it does is it kind of, you almost then take the burden for that person because they're like, oh, okay, this person, I trust that they're going to carry this for me and solve this because they really get it. So it's almost like that pressure release. For them. But also what it does at that point is it also lets them from a sales perspective, and this can feel quite uncomfortable, but I think one of the things in sales, everybody is really nervous to part with money, even more so in the UK than the US, which is interesting. Um, but actually, they're just, they need to, <laughs> well, I Sorry. Was, no, so, so, that's it. It's always the, uh, yeah, what's, what's wrong with it before we actually go and jump. But yeah, so in terms of that, it's about kind of just reliving what they've told you and walking them back through that journey to just really remind them that you get why they need the support. They trust you that you get that. And they also get that final reminder of, okay, yeah, this is my problem. This is the solution. And this is what I need solving. So those are kind of the two things that we do and, and what they try to trigger in, in the client that you're going to speak to. You spoke about the importance of, of, of emotional intelligence. Can you uh, describe what you think emotional intelligence is in the context of sales? You, to be fair, we probably have already touched on it actually. Uh, and also how you cultivated it and how you continue to develop it and teach it, I suppose, as well. Yeah, great question. So in terms of what do I see emotional intelligence as in sales, I think it is, and again, to the point we made earlier about extrovert versus, versus introverted, everybody can do this. It just so happens that the introverts typically have got a little bit more of an upper hand because they're listeners naturally. But actually what it is, is it's understanding, first of all, being aware of your your own emotions from a sales perspective and not pushing for the sale because you're going to lose the sale if you're pushing for the sale really early on so yeah. it's about being aware of and relating your own emotions first of all it's then also about picking up on the tone of the problem i think it's a really really delicate place when we're in sales because we learn a lot about the clients that we speak to and 
we may work with them we may not work with them but even still we're digging into pains that are really personal or financially like personal for these individuals and it's about being aware of those specific repercussions for the different challenges or wants or needs that these clients speak about the other layer on that from a client perspective is having the emotional intelligence to predict that so for example we'll use the financial one because it's an easy one if someone's struggling financially okay great what questions do we need to ask next to be sensitive about it but also to find the right pain point so a financial pressure is going to likely be causing x y and z so that's what I see as emotional intelligence within within sales itself. Any questions on that before I talk about how we, we cultivate and teach it? No, that's good. Nice. Okay, cool. So in, in terms of how we, we kind of teach it and encourage it, really, um, we have an, a whole avatar program or, or kind of um, module within the program, sorry, which is where we need to, for the different businesses and the sales reps that we work with, need to help them discover who their avatars are. Typically in businesses, you're going to have the same kind of demographic that you're focusing on, but each of those avatars are going to have different pain points, different wants, needs, and desires. And it's a whole piece of work that we can do before even actually speaking to these people. We can do assumptive pain point identification or personality traits because what that helps us do on those actual sales calls is again, guide the right questions, guide the right pace, play the right character. And actually by having that level of profile helps these sales reps who before maybe might not have practiced that emotional intelligence to just be guided by something that helps them to walk through it and practice it and again it is just through listening it's how do we listen to these clients and actually play back what they need from us so that's that's how we train it so when you say avatar do you mean you fit the customers into an avatar like a sort of myers-briggs-esque um enfp rubbish which is is rubbish to be fair don't do it um or do you mean you fit the salesperson into an avatar and you you match them up? Yeah. Other, other way around. So so what we have is your, the salesperson in, in a sales call. I actually, I love this bit. I actually use a huge vanilla ice cream in my training um, to basically remind people that they have to start off vanilla because their character needs to fit. So the salesperson will, will always remain fluid in a conversation. So they need to play and they need to play. The actual customers, this is what we do the avatar work on. And the way that we do that is we tend to try and break it down into ideally three, but we can span it out depending on the type of clients that people are working with. That then gives us, we even give them names <laughs> so we can have like a potential customer fit for that individual so that we can then understand what questions and, and what sort of solutions would, would fit for those avatars based on customer profile. Okay. So you, you say, well, I, when you use the term vanilla ice cream, you're, you're basically saying that you, you need to approach any customer in a vanilla way, which is interesting because I was trying to think, I thought you'd want to match the person's immediate personality. Um, there, there's a, there's a book that, um, I read, listened to a little bit, which was, I don't sort of um, endorse sort of pick up artistry, but it was quite interesting from a psychological point of view. And this guy broke down, he said, the three archetypes of when you, uh, you need to play three characters when you engage with, with, um, with women to sort of take them on this sort of emotional sort of journey, which is completely spot on, I think. And he was like, you start off this hyper... A gregarious extroverted um person then you what was the next character then i think it was you become slightly resistant and maybe you make them um claw sort of claw at you so to speak and then you become a bit more quiet and sort of subdued and divulge things but what you're saying is is that you go in vanilla and then what do you do once you've once you've established that relationship yeah i mean i can't give away all my secrets i mean i'll tell you a little so in in terms of in terms of kind of what what we do the theory behind it so keep talking keep talking oh there we go okay so the theory behind it um is if let's say you're an introvert quite serious person maybe and you're taking this conversation really really seriously 
if I then go and match that from my first assumption of the first 10 seconds of us speaking, it might actually just be because you're nervous on the call. And I've got to match that. And now suddenly you're even more nervous because I'm a super mega serious person and you feel that like you've got to keep that up. Or alternatively, it could be because somebody's actually, they were late and then they were just a little bit like flustered and then you've matched that kind of same excited energy incorrectly. So actually by what we do really early on in the call, we don't want to talk really at all. So actually what we're trying to do is get that person to talk before we get into the bulk of things so that we have the time to analyze and identify who, who they are before we play the character. So that's that's what we're trying to do here. Okay. So what's that was another one of the questions. What's your opinion on, because what's your idea on the sort of the the jostling for position of power in a in a sales sort of negotiation engagement in the sense of the person that speaks first always loses and if you're if you know if you're hard asked and you're resistant to any negotiation the person will ultimately is likely to concede what's your opinion on all on, on all that sort of um the the power play of, of sales and and is that does that fall into the category of sort of mismanagement and maybe uh deceptive sales tactics it's interesting because like from the terms that you've read off like listen listen to the words in it like jostling or like win lose or like it, it's all these words of like why is it a battle like it's these people are there to like help so with all these terms that people talk about of like you need to be dominant or you need to be leading and like all of these things. How do you know if that character needs that type of person? Like it's so hard for these sales reps that we see that are all, or sales coaches that are teaching, this is the strategy and whoever talks first, blah, 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 blah. Like actually the silence play is really important, but not from a factor of you win or lose. The kind of psychology behind that, and you can actually see it on people's faces, which is really interesting. The psychology behind the silence is we've gone through a sales call at this point and we have done a load of talking and we're asking this person for investment. At no point in that conversation yet have hey, they had time to just have a quick word with themselves and go, oh my God, where is that money on this card, that card? Can I afford this? Is it going to be beneficial? Does this all make sense? Because you've just been talking at them. The reason for that silence is if we break that silence, we lose them having that internal monologue and they don't make the decision. Yeah. If we allow that silence in that point and we let them have that, they're going to close because they've had that internal dialogue. It's not about winning or losing. We just don't cut off their internal conversation. And I think it's this whole ethos around people being like, yeah, we're going to win and we're going to be dominant. We're going to push them and like do all that thing is why there's such a bad stick. Like you've said, why there's such a bad stick for this kind of domineering or deceptive sales because people feel like it's this tug of war battle when actually we just want to help people relate to them what their problem is and why they need the solution and encourage them to make a decision and and that that is what we should be doing in sales but it just doesn't happen widely which is why it's so exciting to uh be in the position that i'm in to be able to actually share more of an ethical process that does convert um to people that need help yes and it, that whole sort of uh sort of ideology and phenomenon gives but gives a rise to a much wider sort of uh societal conversation on the the ethic uh the ethics of sort of capitalism and free commerce and mm -hmm. the the uh an open market and things like that and the the s slight condemnation that the whole entity has gone under in re in increasingly in recent years and increasingly more and more with young people is because of the prevalence for these unethical engagements to take place and the susceptibility to corruption and how it, it is it's a perennial it's always on we're always on the because i'm um i'm a big football fan and i'm very interested in the sort of the underground aspect of football so behind the scenes and you 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 watch these billionaires and the institutions interact and you can't help but think that i often 
this is something that my dad says quite a lot. He says, Ollie, true capitalism sits right on the edge of exploitation. And and I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I understand what he means because both parties have to come away uh, rewarded and uh, re- remunerated appropriately. And and that's always the issue, isn't it? Especially the the more the higher up the the chain you go, the more of an exponential reward you want to get, and and that's where. But you have to balance it out with. I oh, know this was is a complete uh, digression. It's not. No, no, it's relevant. It is. But um, okay, good. But so, what's your? No. Yeah. I just just say one little yeah, thing. I was... Just one little thing. <laughs> right. um, so, but I, I I think that's a, that's a very negative. It's a shame that we've reached that point in society because true capitalism should be, as we've spoken about throughout, a means for beneficial, mutually beneficial. Um, it's like in North Wall Street when it goes. But if you can, that that's the problem that you're endeavouring with. Is that there's always these uh, people that they want to rinse you for as much as they possibly can, and that's where part of the the the, the uh, demonization, the bastard bastardization of the entity has come. But the whole point mm-hmm. of sort of capitalism and a free market should be that people have freedom, which isn't actually the uh, untrammeled virtue that everyone thinks it is, unfortunately. But that everything gets better for everyone that's kind of the the whole point is that mutually advantageous and beneficial not just for the people involved but then also for there's a the story of another digression but then i'll let you talk the story of king george and the dragon or etc is basically is fundamentally a story of entrepreneurship it really in the sense of the the individual goes out into the unknown, which is the place where the uh, place of untapped potential, but also of great danger, and then retrieves something of value, which is why dragons guard gold, and then returns it back to um, the distributes it back to the uh, society that they came from, and also the reason there's there's a yeah that's enough um so it's a yeah it's a story of um it's just a, a, another example of the way these things link but anyway you were going to talk so you t- no i was i was just going to say that you're you're absolutely right because i think based on what we were talking about in terms of higher up the chain and the further detached you get you are right and i think what actually happens is there are there's a huge culture now for sales reps who are actually really detached from any of the operational side of the business which i think is important because sales reps should be selling but actually they focus so hard on just getting the sale through and getting the commissions through they then suddenly forget about can we actually help this person and i think what we've started to see with the businesses that we work with is the more genuinely concerned they are for whether that client is a good fit for what they do obviously the better the reviews get they get more referrals, they get more testimonials, their marketing refines and their business grows out of doing good rather than stressing in the position that they're in, treading water, just trying to get anybody in and then ultimately having bad reviews, disgruntled clients and refunds and stuff. So it's it's a totally different aspect when when we look at that. So yeah, I think it's definitely a relevant story. I, I think I found the first post on your Instagram and it was, uh, what would you, what I didn't, what would you go back and tell yourself if you had a time machine? There was a post about something to do with that, and I thought that was quite interesting. I love that. I mean, I'm going to have to refresh for what I actually said on this now, so let's go and have a look. <laughs> so, in terms of what I would go back and tell myself with, so this was actually a conversation I had with my little sister. I remember this. I have the I have the post here. There we go. <laughs> so, in terms, oh yeah, okay, I love this. And I wanted to get the specific because I remember writing this post and it, it, it means so much. So I think, so when I was going through my kind of corporate ranks and growing many, many years ago, I was in the position of where I was running myself ragged. 
and I was doing everything that I possibly could and I was using all of my energy and I just wasn't looking after myself and it was when I just got to a point where I remember I was absolutely shattered I literally sat on the end of my bed and I was like I don't want to get up this morning I don't have any energy and I just realized I just used all the gas in the tank and I was running totally on fumes and I was like right we need to start thinking about how I can give myself a little bit more help here so what I started to try and actively do every single day was give tomorrow's me a little bit of help and what that might have been like is just simple things of like looking after myself so it could have been something like I knew I was going to be out all day so I need to get my lunch ready it could be something like that it, and maybe that I had 10 minutes left and there was an admin task I knew I didn't want to do so I'd just get it done so tomorrow me didn't need to deal with it and actually just by doing that I started to develop this kind of process of having my own back which was just something I'd never ever done before and I think with that I became more selfless for today's me in the tasks I maybe didn't want to do and I kept pushing them off because I then started to have empathy for tomorrow's me and tomorrow's me didn't want to do it either <laughs> so that kind of analogy just helped me help me out much. So you go back and tell your younger self that to start doing that earlier? Start doing it earlier Christ <laughs> yeah that's so if I was looking out for tomorrow's me a hell of a lot earlier, I would be further than I am today. So yes. 